G'day Year 12 Methods students and welcome to our first uh, lesson on probability. Um, in this section we're going to go over um, some key, I guess, ideas that you would have covered in Year 11, um, but still some important definitions and notations that you definitely need to remember um, before getting any further into the probability topic. So let's get stuck into it. Um, the first thing that we kind of are going to talk about with um, probability here is the idea of events occurring. Um, and an event is just like, you know, something that can either happen or not happen. Um, and probability is really like a numerical measure of the chance of that event happening. You should remember that probabilities are always a number uh, between zero and one. Uh, so mm -hmm. the smallest possible probability is zero, the greatest possible probability is one. Um, and they can be represented as decimals, fractions and percentages. Um, the set of all possible outcomes, so outcomes being like a word for results, so the set of all possible outcomes or results of a particular experiment is called the sample space. So the sample space kind of represents all the things that can happen um, when an event takes place, um, or sorry, when a, a trial or experiment takes place, and an event is a subset of the sample space. So for example, if you roll a six-sided die, the sample space would be one, two, three, four, five, six, because they're all the possible outcomes or possible results. And an event could be any of these things, like rolling a six, that's an event that either can happen or not happen. Um, rolling an odd number, that's an event that could either happen or not happen. And rolling a number less than three, an event that can either happen or not happen when we conduct this um, experiment of rolling a die. Okay, the probability of an event A is calculated by uh, probability of A equals the number of favourable outcomes divided by the total number of outcomes. That's something you should be pretty familiar with. Um, you know, that's just like saying if you roll a mm. dice, what's the probability you get an even number? Well, it's three out of six, which is a half. Um, okay, some other important notation to remember. When we use this little A dash or put a dash on something, that just means the event not occurring. So the probability of A not occurring can be represented as probability of A dash. Um, and that's one minus the probability of A occurring, okay? Um, these other two things, we're pretty familiar with these, but again, just important reminders, the probability of A and B um, both occurring is represented with this intersection symbol. So PR, A, intersection B. If it's A or B, so either one or the other, or both of them, then we use the union symbol. So the probability of A or B occurring. Um, this one I'm just going to skip because it's actually a double up here and it's written below. The addition rule of probability says that for any two events A and B, the probability of A or B occurring is equal to the probability of A plus the probability of B minus the probability of both. Um, that's the addition rule of probability. Um, it's nice to see that from a Venn diagram actually, but just in the interest of saving a bit of time, I'm going to keep pushing through. Um, Last little bit of theory here before we get into some examples. Um, mutually exclusive events. Mutually exclusive just means the two events cannot both happen together. Okay, so for example, when you toss a coin, you can't get heads and tails. You can only get one or the other, so those two events are mutually exclusive, which means that the probability of A and B both occurring is zero. All right. In these couple of examples we're about to do, we're, we're going to have a look at it. Again, a couple of diagrams that you should remember well from previous years of studying probability. Um, the first one, we're going to look at a Venn diagram and a probability table in the same example. So let's get stuck into it. We've got a class of 30 music students, 20 of them play the drums and 18 of them play the guitar. Now, straight away, those two numbers add up to more than 30. So there must be some students who play both instruments. All right. uh, four students in the class play neither drums nor guitar. So. What we could do is we could say, okay, well, those four students, if we're trying to represent this information in a Venn diagram to start with, the four students who play neither instrument would go on the outside, right? So we can put the four there. We've now got 26 students um, left, right, uh, to go in these other three spaces. Now, the 20 that play drums and the 18 that play guitar, well, 20 plus 18 gives me... 38, but I really only want these three numbers to sum to 26. And so the, I guess, how far I've overshot that, or the difference between the 38 and the 26 is 12. And that tells me there must be 12 students who play both instruments. So if I put a 12 in here, 
if my assumption here, if I want to check this, well, I've got 12 students that I'm saying play drums and guitar. That would leave me with uh, eight more students who play the drums, but they must play just the drums, not the guitar. And if there's 18 in total who play the guitar, but we think there's 12 who play both, that leaves me with six students who play the guitar, but not the drums. And then the final check is to make sure that these four numbers actually do add up to 30 because that's how many students they're supposed to be. Eight and 12 is 20, plus six is 26, plus four is 30. Okay, so um, you can sort of do these Venn diagram questions like this one, there's almost a bit of a fill in the blank. Now, a probability table suggests that we're gonna put probabilities in here. So what we can do is go, um, and we can do these as fractions or decimals, it doesn't matter too much, but we've got, um, I guess, some values we can take from our Venn diagram. If we start with, say, the number of students playing both drums and guitar. So that's gonna be 12 out of 30 as a probability. Um, I'm gonna to have to write small here, but that's okay. 12 out of 30, which as a simplified fraction um, is gonna get down to what, six out of 15, which becomes two fifths. So the probability of um, any particular student in this class playing drums or guitar would be two fifths, okay? Um, if we make our way through, if we look at this section here, this represents playing guitar but not drums. So that would be the six students in this part of the diagram. So that would be six students out of 30, which will be one fifth. You can hopefully just see those numbers big enough there. Should have made this table a bit bigger. Um, Okay, this number here is the students who play drums but not guitar, so drums but not guitar, that's over here, that's eight out of 30. So as a simplified probability, that would be four fifteenths. Um, and neither drums nor guitar, that was four out of 30, which would be two fifteenths. Okay, so you can kind of see that the four values in the Venn diagram correspond to these four entries here. What a probability table also gives you though, which can be handy in lots of questions, is these sort of, um, this extra row and column where you can add up the totals, right? So for example, the total, um, I guess, proportion of students in this class who play guitar would be the two fifths plus the one fifths. It would be three fifths, okay? We could also get that from saying, well, there's 18 students who play guitar and 18 out of 30 is three fifths, right? So it's sort of corresponding to two things there. Um, and then therefore, if I'm looking across this bottom row here, well, three fifths of the students play guitar, that must mean two fifths don't play guitar. And as a total, that gives me one, which it should, right? If I add the proportion of people playing the guitar to the proportion of people who are not playing the guitar, that should be everybody. Working across these rows here, again, we can do our totals the same way. Um, so I can do two fifths plus four fifteenths. So what's that? It's really six fifteenths plus four fifteenths. So that's 10 fifteenths, which is equal to two thirds. So two thirds of the students play drums. Again, we knew that from the 20 out of 30 as well. So there's a couple of ways we can get that answer, which means one third must not play drums and two thirds plus one third gives me that total probability of one. So you can sort of see, and hopefully again, this is a, rem a reminder of using these last year, but you can see how those totals kind of come together at the end. And we've got a few different ways of checking that our entries are correct. Okay, hence state the probability that a randomly chosen student from this class plays both guitar and drums. So we could write that as PR G intersection D and we can just go to our probability table and get the two fifths straight away. All right, uh, another good friend of ours is the tree diagram, which can be useful in lots of probability questions. Tree diagram questions are really useful for repetitive events or when you sort of have one event occurring after another. Sometimes it's the same event multiple times. Sometimes it might be two different events, but sort of happening almost sequentially like one after the other. And we want a tree diagram to represent um, what's going on. So let's have a look at an example where we're going to roll a regular six-sided die three times. Okay, now when we roll a, a six-sided die, there's lots of outcomes, right? There's one, two, three, four, five, six, which can lead to really messy tree diagrams. But if we read this question carefully, the question is only asking about whether we roll odd numbers or even numbers, which lets us take a bit of a shortcut with our tree diagram. 
what we can do is say, all right, well, when we roll this die the first time, we can either get odd or even, I'm just gonna use O and E for shorthand. Then when we roll it again, we can either get odd or even. And when we roll it the third time, again, our possibilities are odd and even. And even with just uh, breaking this down to two possible outcomes, you can see that tree diagrams can get a little bit squished and a little bit messy. So if you've got if you've got the space, best to draw them nice and big on a on a, a sort of empty page. Okay, so we can see from this tree diagram here that when we look at the the very end possibilities, we've actually got eight possible outcomes here, eight different combinations of odds and evens as we roll this die three times. So when we're setting up some probabilities, we've got uh, eight events that have an equal chance of happening. So our probabilities, at least initially, before we simplify them, will be uh, fractions out of eight. All right, so the probability of rolling three odd numbers, I could write that as P-R-O-O-O, -O -O, odd, odd, odd. All right, now the only way I can get three odd numbers is if I get odd number, then odd number, then odd number. So I've got one possibility here out of eight. So the probability of three odd numbers is just one out of eight. The probability of rolling exactly one even number would actually be the probability of rolling, so I could roll the even number first and then get two odd numbers. I could roll odd, even, and then odd. Or I could roll odd, odd, even. Right, there are actually three ways when you sort of start from the start and make your way through the tree diagram. There are three different ways that I can get exactly one even number. And so that probability would be three out of eight, or three eighths. Okay, and third and final example here, the chance of a photocopier working is 0.9 and the chance of there being enough paper in it is 0.7. Find the probability that the photocopier is working but there's not enough paper and then that a person can su cannot successfully photocopy documents. So basically you can imagine this like you walk up to a photocopier and you can tell a teacher's written this example. You walk up to a photocopier and it can either be working or not working. And then if it is working, you're gonna to try to print something or photocopy something, but there's also a chance there's not enough paper in there. So we can actually set this up as a tree diagram question where we say, uh, all right, well, let's say W for working and then W dash for not working and the probability of the machine working is 0.9, which means the probability that it doesn't work is 0.1. And then let's say P can represent enough paper. And so P dash can be not enough paper. And there's a 0.7 chance that there is enough paper. So that means there's a 0.3 chance that there is not enough paper. So with these, tree diagrams, you know, before when we had each probability was just sort of a half, it almost wasn't necessary to put the probabilities on. The tree diagram was just to show us the different combinations of um, outcomes. Here, it's more relevant to put the, the probabilities on our tree diagram. And so then when we go to work things out, like what's the probability the photocopier is working, but there is not enough paper, we can say probability of W and P dash is equal to, uh, we can multiply the probability. So we kind of just follow the events. It's working, but then not enough paper. So that's 0.9 times 0.3. All right, now you should be able to do these sorts of things without a calculator. Nine threes are 27, and you've got two decimal places in your question, so there should be two decimal places in your answer. So it's 0 0.27 as a probability as a decimal. Um, second part's a bit trickier. The probability that a a person cannot successfully photocopy documents, right? So they just, whether it's not working or there's not enough paper, we're just looking for the probability that they can't successfully photocopy documents. There are a couple of ways you can do this, but probably the quickest way is to say the probability that they, I'm gonna write this, probability can't copy equals one minus the probability that they can copy. All right, now the probability that they can copy, there would have to be that the machine is working and there's enough paper. 
So, the probability that we can't copy is equal to 1 minus 0.9 times 0.7. And again, nine sevens, well, that's 63. Two decimal places in the question gives you two de decimal places in the answer, so it's 0.63. And then one minus 0.63 gives you 0 0.37 as the probability that you can't successfully copy. Now, that's not the only way to work it out. I just think it's the most efficient way. The other way would have been to add together all the different probabilities that involve not being able to photocopy. Right, but you would actually have three separate probabilities to add together, whereas here we really only had to work out one probability and subtract it. So to me, that's the best strategy for those sorts of questions, but it's useful to know that there are other ways of working those things out. As always, if you need some help with any of these examples or anything from exercise 12a, get in touch with your teachers, but otherwise, it's bye for now and see you next time.